So hello to everyone and uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to joining us to this uh, webinar, Data Analysis Goes Wrong. Uh, my name is Michael Machlevich and I'll represent myself, I'll present myself um, in a few seconds. But uh, a little bit before that, I would like to touch uh, briefly on uh, what you're going to hear today because data analysis and this headline, data analysis goes wrong. Data analysis is a huge, huge topic and if you really want to make no mistakes there, uh, there is plenty of things to learn. Um, I think the best thing, the best way to learn data analysis is a, on a hands-on experience. Uh, usually when I'm talking about data analysis, I'm trying to do workshops. Uh, but I do think there is some value um, in talking more generally about data analysis and how to uh, avoid, avoid pitfalls and not choosing uh, slippery slopes uh, with data analysis. I think there are some uh, frameworks and uh, mindsets that you can uh, come to data analysis with, uh, which will increase significantly um, the, the chances of you getting uh, this thing completely wrong. Um, but th that's what we're going to talk about, right? We're going to talk about mindsets and the framework of how to think about uh, data analysis and uh, what to look for, uh, and not uh, we won't uh, query data currently or uh, build graphs. So as I said, my name is uh, Michal Machlevich. Uh, currently, I'm a senior product manager at Microsoft. Uh, for three years now, all the time, I was doing data security. Uh, before that, um, I served in the Israeli intelligence forces. Uh, I was a data analyst there and an officer uh, leading a group of data analysts. So uh, you can understand this topic is uh, close to heart, uh, both analyzing data, protecting data, everything uh, related to data is what I was doing my uh, basically whole adult life. Um, and again, I'll, I'll revisit uh, now when we talk about the agenda. Uh, here we'll focus on data analysis from product management perspective. Uh, it's a topic with lots of different perspectives. Uh, statisticians have uh, some great points about it and uh, products have uh, great points about it and uh, people that are doing data visualization, graphic artists have uh, great points about uh, data analysis and how to communicate it and how to work with it. Uh, we would want to look at it from product management perspective uh, and we'll go from where do we start um, in, in, as a general question, right? Uh, how do I approach at all the whole the data analysis process or project um, or you know, just check um, with which data I want to start and how it will end. You'll understand better uh, when we'll talk about it, what are the consequences. Um, how do I check if I, uh, if I learned well, if I done something well with that and we'll summarize all of these at the end. So uh, the most natural place to start is uh, asking where to start. And to make sure we're all on the same page, let's go uh, briefly on the kind of like basic or intuitive uh, data analysis project or task uh, life cycle. So uh, naturally, um, I want to analyze data. I need to have a data. And so we're starting with getting the data. Um, it can be finding the databases, finding the sensors, uh, doing interviews with the customers, uh, scraping the internet in a legal manner, of course. Uh, but if you want to analyze the data, you need to have some data. Uh, then you need to prepare the data. And I kind of like grouped here all uh, and abstracted here all the different operations uh, you can do, uh, filtering the data, uh, reformatting the data, um, enriching the data, all of those things. You need to prepare the data. A lot of times data doesn't come uh, that clean and that work to that easy to work with from the beginning. Then uh, it's pretty poetically, it's in the center of the diagram, but that's the heart of the thing. You analyze the data, you are trying to understand how to read things with uh, query languages, uh, looking into graphs and asking yourself questions with the data. And then you evaluate results. It's something that in data analysis, not, uh, in that, it's not common enough um, in my uh, view. Um, if people are here familiar with all this uh, data science machine learning world, so there it's an obvious no brainer. You always put aside some evaluation uh, group. And in data analysis, it's not the same practice, but uh, we do need to, I think we can take uh, example from, from uh, this practice as a concept of checking your results and eventually you need to communicate it. So pretty basic, right? 
the issue here is that uh, the way I see it, uh, it's wrong. Um, you always need to start with the problem. Product managers start with the problem. Uh, too often, uh, I see uh, situations when someone just got a data somewhere, found a nice uh, source of data, started analyzing it without any specific goal in mind, uh, just found something and now trying to force a problem to uh, this data. Um, data can be manipulated and forced to practically anything that you want. You always can slice and dice and uh, change and flip the data uh, as you wish. Uh, if you won't start with the problem, if you won't come with something specific in mind, uh, you'd probably uh, doomed to do a lot of uh, mistakes. I think the best metaphor here, and this is an important thing to remember, and even if you need to leave now, this at the beginning of this webinar, but you'll learn this, uh, I already done my job, but you need to remember that that analysis is just a tool, right? It's like you're not going inside your house with the hammer and waving it and asking what I can hammer with it, what they can hammer with it. Uh, you have something you, you know you need to stick into the wall, so you bring the hammer. Same thing with data analysis. So let's see how data analysis can help us with our problems. Um, we are product managers, as we said, we always start with the problem and hey, we have a problem. So first two things is uh, uh, when you have a problem, a good thing to ask is, is it actually a problem? Uh, sometimes a problem is only a cause of a deeper root problem. And sometimes the problem is just an anomaly and probably it's not that of a problem. Um, another interesting question is to ask is that problem is a tangible problem or a perceptional problem? Every time a customer comes with an ask or an issue, a problem of the customer, um, as product managers, we should uh, empathize with the customer. Um, but sometimes the, problem, sometimes the problems are actual problems. Someone is telling me, hey, this is slow. Um, all right, I can go and check the telemetry and see that uh, some process is actually taking a lot of time relatively to other processes and indeed it's slow. And sometimes this is only a perceptional problem. There is only a perception that this is slow because I'm not showing the progress because this is kind of like a dead time to the customer and is getting bored. There is this really famous uh, story about uh, the elevator and the mirror that uh, uh, visitors at a new hotel uh, were complaining that the elevators are slow and they were indeed technically slow, but the solution was perceptional. Um, the, uh, the hotel added mirrors in front of the, uh, in front of the elevator doors. So uh, the visitors could uh, just look at themselves. They didn't feel the time was passing and they stopped complaining that the uh, elevator is slow. So when someone comes to you with the problem, you can uh, measure if it's an actual problem, tangible problem, or it's a perceptional problem. Luckily for us, uh, most of the time, we don't have a problem. We have a file of problems. So uh, data analysis can also help us uh, with the task of prioritizing and uh, to understand uh, how big a problem is, uh, how common it is, how frequent it is, and does it apply to some specific cohort of our customers? And maybe we are now currently want to emphasize and double down on another cohort or on this cohort. So this is also an important thing. And the last thing um, as a general idea that uh, people tend to forget is when we deliver our solution and um, sometimes we don't check it actually solved the problem. So before we read all out of all of these problem lists, and we want to uh, put uh, our data measurements to make sure that we solve the problem that we uh, just, uh, just uh, measured before. And if we do that, we'll be data-driven, right? The holy grail uh, of the current times, a, a very popular term, everybody wants to be data-driven. I had the problem, but they came with a data-driven approach. And then now I uh, analyze the problem, I did the data analysis, I understand the problem, the size of it, uh, who it applies to, everything is uh, great, right? Again, wrong, um, or at least somehow wrong. Um, I hate the term data brief. Um, I believe words have meaning and words affect the uh, mindset and uh, data-driven for me, uh, when I hear data-driven, I imagine uh, the data leading and we are following, uh, like this great cover by uh, Financial Times Magazine. Um, again, uh, I, I said it already, and it's really important for me to make sure that this is really, really clear before uh, the other part of the webinar and the rest of the webinar. Uh, data is just a tool. Data uh, is not leading us. We shouldn't be blind following the data. Um, it's, it's somehow 
there is sometimes the perception that data is kind of like the objective total truth and people forget that other people are those that write the data uh, that they chose which question to ask the data and it's not uh, like uh, the data come with its own insights so we need to remember um, that we shouldn't be data driven i think much better term for the same thing for what we want to achieve would be customer driven data informed and uh, this time the uh, the five walks are real uh, i won't do this uh, trick again of uh, hey is that uh, great no it's actually wrong we've been through that so where to start with a good question in hand for product managers we come to solve uh, problems and i think maybe it's not intuitive but to avoid data analysis problems the first thing to remember is that we're not here for the data analysis per se we have a problem uh, to solve we have a customer pain to to check to investigate we use data analysis which is a great tool for that but it's not our main goal from the beginning but let's assume now we have a problem and we want to start with our data analysis no more tricks with which data to start and how it will end so we're back to this where they went through the problem and now we have all the other pipeline getting the data preparing the data etc cetera, etc cetera. each of those cubicles has lots of really great and amazing material at the, uh, at the world wide web and the internet you can find it uh, again i am pro uh, hands on experience but uh, a point i wanted to touch and i think is a, it's a particularly delicate is that there is intersections and uh, inter influence between those cubicles and uh, what we're mainly going to talk about is how analyzing data might affect the data itself that we're getting and when i talk about which data to get i'm not going to talk about do you want to put it in a relational database or should it be a graph data or should it be small or large or stuff like that but as a concept as a feature which types of data uh, we want to look for and uh, we will see that we want to look at for data that has uh, roots in the real world that is not uh, kind of like auto generated and which is close to the problem and to the incentive of the problem as much as possible uh, that would make it uh, prone to manipulations as much as possible so we'll start with a great story uh, one of my favorites the cobra effect uh, which is the fancy and more intriguing name to the perverse incentive uh, effect that's the official name and the story goes like that uh, during the british rule in india uh, the british governors in delhi uh, realized there are lots of uh, cobras around uh, venomous cobras uh, and they wanted to uh, decrease this number they were uh, afraid they came up with a great idea uh, crowdsource crowdsource this problem right uh, so they uh, published uh, this program bring a dead cobra get a bounty all the work would be transmitted to the local population they kill cobras they get money and it's a poor population they like money all sounds great the issue here is that um, although if you want to measure the decrease of cobras measuring dead cobras it sounds almost the same but there is a little gap there right you assume that if you had a constant amount of cobras and then you're killing cobras the total number of cobras decreases but you have some assumption there and always when you have some assumption always when you have a gap always when you make this one small step something can can, can come into this gap what actually happened in that story uh, some of you might guess it some of my some of you might heard it uh, the the population the local population started breeding cobras to kill them and sell them um it just was um financial enough for them uh, they uh, they breeded cobras uh, killed them paid them uh, breeding cobras is cheap the bounty was high enough uh, when the british realized that this is what is happening and they stopped the project all the people that had those cobra farms they had nothing to do with them anymore so they just released them ending up increasing the uh, cobra population and you might say um well all right this is a funny story great story i like it um it wouldn't happen to me uh, it's anecdote from the past it wouldn't happen again uh, you would be surprised how many stories like this there are uh, through the whole history from people that i'm sure already heard about the cobra effect uh, the same the same same thing happened uh, to the french in uh, vietnam with mouses um, exactly the same story uh, it happened to the us uh, with wild boars 
exactly the same story. It happened to the European Union um, with uh, pollution, uh, with handling pollution. They gave bounties to companies uh, that uh, handled their uh, pollution, their environmental pollution. But some companies that weren't doing so good financially realized that they'll get more money from creating pollution just to handle this pollution and ending up polluting more than they uh, intended from the first place or they needed from the first place. And I think th this is a, a great example of when you think um, I'll do, I, I have some data target I, I, and to just like boil it down to something smaller. It's a great example for when you uh, want to do some data analysis, you put some dashboard and you see, all right, I'll measure this thing. I'll have this great dashboard. And you don't think about it that once you have this dashboard, people uh, might change their behavior and, uh, to align uh, to the incentive of this dashboard. So this is one example uh, where people try to manipulate or trick um, the, the measurement or the analysis um, to get some uh, uh, value for themselves. Uh, we have another great example when uh, the company uh, realized uh, the situation, realized that people are trying to uh, change um, their behavior, uh, their measurements, their data inputs um, just, to, just to play the game. Uh, and this example is a uh, search engine optimization. Um, basically, this is a word created for Google. Uh, you want your website to be uh, up the top of the results of Google. Uh, so what you do, you optimize for it. Uh, Google is doing some data analysis at the background. They started with, I wouldn't call this basic, but I know kind of way more simpler than what they have today, uh, algorithm. And that is counting uh, uh, links and uh, words and trying to understand which websites would be relevant for your search. Then people try to hack it. And they said, all right, if I'll just push a lot of uh, keywords and metadata keywords uh, into the background um, of my website, I, I wouldn't even show them. This will uh, just jump higher in the Google uh, search. Google has realized that and they started uh, improving their engine uh, again and again and again. Uh, trying to avoid those hacks. But at some point, this also started to in, in incentivize um, the users to do what they see as good behaviors using exactly the same system. Uh, so uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, today you your uh, search record will be optimized if you'd be a mobile, uh, mobile friendly, if you have a, a mobile uh, view. Or if you're using HTTPS, which means you are more secure uh, communication for your website. So here again, uh, this company understood that their analysis, which is coming to use, um, is, uh, is uh, affecting people's behavior. And they use it for presumably a, a good reason uh, to create a good behavior. Same thing happens with data analysis, dashboards, KPIs, you put a goal. Uh, you measure to it, and when the measurement is reflected to anyone, um, so anyone can push uh, push towards this goal. Uh, but here again, connecting to the corporate effect we just saw, you need to make sure that you're measuring exactly what you want. Because if there is a gap, someone can manipulate this gap and ha hack this gap. Up till now, we saw two examples of uh, uh, when, a when a customer or a user or someone is trying to manipulate your data analysis and change his data for some of his own value or benefit. But there are some uh, situations when you have just an uh, adversarial uh, actor, someone that doesn't emphasize with your goal or doesn't like what you're doing, just want to, uh, just want to uh, uh, sabotage your data analysis or your analysis. Uh, so anyone can think what is this guy or this picture has to do with the topic? All right. So actually, uh, this person has uh, nothing to do with it, but his shirt is a anti-facial recognition shirt. Uh, this is a shirt that's trying to uh, mess with the facial recognition algorithms uh, to avoid them. A lot of people are uh, uh, angry about them. We also have those examples of people just trying to mess with autonomous cars uh, and make them stuck in the circle. They're creating this uh, actually uh, not real world data. We don't have actual this situation uh, with, word, uh, with road marks uh, in the real life. But people are manipulating the real world, creating uh, manipulated data for the sensors um, to mess with them. Um, I don't know. I think this is just for uh, came out as a joke. And we also have examples like this one. 
Um, it's a Chrome extension with the tagline, uh, clicking ads so you don't have to. And uh, uh, what they actually do is you install them and they click all the uh, advertisers for you, uh, creating an obfuscation of what actually interests you. So uh, big, uh, big uh, companies couldn't uh, spy on you. Uh, assuming that if you are interested in everything, this is pretty much as being interested in nothing. But at this point, you might say, all right, uh, Mickey, you came here with some really nice stories. They're all uh, extreme cases. Um, it's someone and that's doing like it has a clear value, clear incentive, and is really pushing it uh, to change it, its behavior for the data. Does people actually, uh, or does data actually affected from being measured in a soft manner? Right? No, not someone that's coming and trying to manipulate them. So I think a good example for this, uh, a good story around this, is uh, the story of Clever Hunt. Um, and clever ants, we, we see here a horse and we see here uh, this guy in a robe, uh, which looks very smart. Um, but uh, clever Hans is uh, the horse when you map. So Hans is the horse, not the guy, which I don't know his name. And maybe it's also Hans. But clever Hans is the story about the horse that knew map. Um, farmer, a few hundred years ago, um, realized his horse can count count and solve the uh, basic uh, math uh, submissions. Uh, you tell him uh, two plus five and it will knock seven times. You tell him 11 plus four and it will knock 15 times. Uh, he realized this fact and started taking his horse to the closest town uh, and showing off uh, his amazing miraculous horse and uh, clever hunts to the population. Uh, the rumor spread away and people came to check this uh, until I guess this guy in the robe is a scientist who came to check what's going on. Uh, they realized that uh, uh, the farmer that owning the, the horse is not cheating. Uh, actually, the crowd can suggest his own map questions and the horse is solving them. And they went checking how this is happening. So what's actually happening is that the horse doesn't know map, but the horse did realize that he's being measured. Um, apparently, when people gave him uh, math, math tasks, uh, he was just starting knocking. And... As he was getting closer and closer to the real result, people got, th there was an excitement in the air, which the horse could feel. They're feeling better than us humans. And there was kind of like a relief or a more expectation to see if we'd stop on, on, the right, on the right number. And the horse was able also to, to feel this moment, this change in crowd tension and to just stop uh, and create the uh, perception that he does know how to count. And I think this is a soft story to understand that sometimes um, affecting the measurements that you take is a, is a derivative of a derivative. Um, it's something that might not be that obvious clearly. And, uh, and you always need to assume that if you are measuring something, if you're analyzing some data, uh, you might affect it over time. And next time you will come to see this data that you just analyzed. Someone uh, may be manipulated, it, maybe manipulated in a good way and improved it. But this is something that can happen. Um, it's a law of nature. Um, if you observe something, you affect the observation. Uh, it comes in quantum physics. And uh, it's also the same in our situation with data. So what do we do? How do we make, how, how do we choose? Uh, what are the criteria to choose stable data? Meet Louis von Ahn. Um, he's a uh, consulting professor at Carnegie Mellon, but he's famous for two totally uh, different things. And uh, I admire him personally. First, he's the creator of reCAPTCHA. Uh, sure, you all stumbled uh, reCAPTCHA. Uh, not sure how many of you know that reCAPTCHA originally was used to train uh, OCR algorithms, algorithms that scan uh, book uh, pictures, the, the algorithms that scan book scans uh, to get the words out of there. Um, it's a picture to, to text, image to text uh, algorithms. And in reCAPTCHA, uh, one word is a word that the computer actually knows uh, what it's meaning. The computer is generating it uh, to check you're a human. The other one is a word that the algorithm got stuck with, and it's an easy task for a person. So uh, Louis Van Hahn formed off crowdsourcing it and uh, teaching the computer, getting this data, what those uh, words that are hard to figure out with OCR mean, uh, using this uh, recapture method. He's also the creator of a really beloved app, uh, Duolingo, the app that uh, uh, teaches languages. 
And I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure they changed it now, but originally uh, one of the ideas of the lingo and something it was doing at start is uh, while it was teaching you a language, it was using what you are learning, the data you are creating while you are learning uh, to translate the internet. Uh, knowing the meaning of the words is an easy task for the computer, but deciding on the context is uh, hard for the computer, but pretty easy for a person, for a human being, if you give him a vocabulary. So that was what Duolingo was doing. It was teaching you uh, some sentences, understanding you are at some uh, good enough level uh, of a language, and then giving you a, a sentence, asking you to translate it. And if most of the population would translate it the same, they would know the translation of the sentence uh, is option A and not option B. I think what really strikes me here, and, and, and this is an amazing insight of Louis von Hahn, is the ability to uh, align the data that he collected with value to the user. Uh, the data that he needed, uh, he, he put the situation uh, in a way that the data that he needed is a byproduct of value for the user. So if you want to manipulate the data that he's collecting, you're actually manipulating the value for the user. And even if there is some adversarial that's coming in to just, uh, I don't know, mess around with the Duolingo recapture algorithms, there is enough of population that get value from those tools uh, to create a massive amount of correct data uh, just because they have their self motive and self incentive. So this idea of alignment, alignment of incentives is a really strong idea. And when you look into data, look into data that looks like this, that you collect signals from actions that bring value to the customer. Because then probably uh, the customer is not manipulating you or you will have at least enough customers that are not manipulating and creating those signals, not for you, but for them. A more basic thing to look at is data. I call it in, in, inescapable data, data which is part of reality, right? And here is a picture from a gym that uh, been a, a bit uh, viral uh, for some time. Uh, we see here a normal distribution. Uh, most of the people take the 20 kilograms, the average, um, or the expected value. Uh, almost none is taking the five kilos or the 40 kilos, which are the extreme values. Um, I put here the headline of uh, where there is smoke, there is fire. Look for things that are rooted in real life. Now, nice example. This is not this, but this is what gave me the association. Um, it's from a, a, a museum. Uh, uh, it's from a museum show uh, by Stefan Stegmaier. It was called uh, the Happy Film uh, Showcase, and it created here those uh, gum machines as an uh, interactive graph and asks people to uh, to take a gum depending on how happy they are. And this is actually not rooted in real life, right? I can take any gun that I want um, and, uh, and it doesn't uh, matter how happy I am. But it made me think about this tool that you maybe have in your office and the Nespresso Pods holder. And I don't know, I at least see here a reverse graph, right? Uh, you look at the far, it's even, or, it's even applied in order, right? And no, one's, no one is taking the red ones and lots of people taking the uh, golden orange ones. Sorry. Uh, so I can assume uh, they are more popular, right? You just flip it and you see a graph of capsule popularity, right? Wrong. If you're listening, uh, this is exactly the case um, of the Cobra effect uh, because I, I have, I, I took a small gap here, right? I assume I have a constant amount of capsules. The ones that are used um, are more popular. So they're probably better for this uh, the population. What's actually happening is that I don't take into account that maybe the red ones are the most popular. So they're switched again and again and again, and the gold ones are there forever. What I actually want to measure here is this thing. Do people actually drink those colors? Um, and, and, and again, the idea here is to look into um, data or signals of data, which are part of the real world. Let's have a small game. Uh, I'll take a sip of water and I'll give you uh, let, 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 give you to give you some time to think about it. Imagine you are in the pre-pandemic world, so much fun, and you are flying to vacation in somewhere. You choose, yay, a vacation. We all love vacations. How would you go about finding a great restaurant? Uh, assuming you have all resources you want, and try to think about data. So I think 
most people, and uh, I among them, would go to TripAdvisor. I found some great restaurants. But if I would fly to London in 2017, which I did pre-pandemic, and I look at the um, TripAdvisor website for the best one, I would find a restaurant ranked number one in London in the end of 2017 that's called The Shed at the Dolwich. What's really interesting about this restaurant is that it's never existed. It's a hawk, uh, hawks created by, a, a, by someone of the Vice magazine um, just to prove a point. And why I really like this example. I like this example because this whole idea of reviews is not part It's not an inherent part of going to a restaurant process. Um, I think about myself. I go to a restaurant that I like with my friends. I don't, usually I don't leave there a review. Uh, and if I leave a review, or I don't leave a review, it, it doesn't change or it doesn't an inherently part of my experience. It doesn't affect my food. Um, it doesn't mean if I ate it or didn't eat it. Um, it just, it, it's something extra uh, that I can do out of my, I don't know, kind of my heart. Um, but that's not inherently uh, in the process of going to a restaurant. What is inherently part of, uh, of eating in a restaurant and, uh, and even enjoying? So one, uh, a bit soft example, but example that I really like is uh, showing off. Um, it became more and more popular now. Uh, we have a lot of uh, foodies that put out food on Instagram. Uh, it's showing off more, it's more the experience of the restaurant than the food, but hey, that's also really important. So we have this uh, app here, um, which is called Borscht, which uses a uh, computer vision to find on Instagram uh, pictures of food. And assuming a restaurant uh, that have a lot of people that are showing off about their food and taking their pictures and celebrating and sharing that they went to this restaurant, uh, it's part of the people's experience. Um, not mine, uh, I don't have Instagram, but there's a, a huge population that that's part of their eating experience and they take these signals and measure in that way popular restaurants. But do way more basic things that also apply to me and I'm sure that apply to you. Um, I'll be careful here uh, in the pre-pandemic world. So the first thing to measure if you want to understand, uh, if you want to measure signals that are inherently connected to eating the restaurant is you need to be in the restaurant, right? If Google Maps would tell tomorrow they're going to, uh, to this market, of uh, restaurant suggestions, I would trust them because they can see uh, how many people actually go to those restaurants. Uh, what are the restaurants that the local people go to because they know where most of the people live. Uh, they can see if I'm returning to the same restaurant or to a new restaurant again and again. Um, they can see uh, maybe if I'm taking a public transportation, which sometimes means that I put more effort to get to some restaurant. So I think they have some great signals. Another great group of signals is uh, paying. Uh, when you go to a restaurant, you need to pay for it. At least I hope you pay for your restaurants. That's what you're supposed to do. So again, if MasterCard would tell me tomorrow they are uh, creating a new application and uh, going to this market of food suggestions, I'll, I'll trust them as well. Uh, they can see if people are going again and again and returning to restaurants. They can see if people go and make big events in restaurants like their birthday or something like that based on the size of the bill, right? So those are, and, and I look at those examples as examples of taking data, which is Part of the reality, you can't go out and eat in a restaurant without being in the restaurant and without paying to that restaurant. Otherwise, you won't get food um, or you won't get the restaurant experience uh, compared to the situation of giving reviews where this is not part um, of inherently part of the uh, restaurant process. And circling back uh, a little bit to the incentive model, even before data, I think it's interesting that one of the uh, symbols of uh, food recommendation came from this uh, physical idea of people that are going to places and you need, if someone is going somewhere in the world, uh, you're collecting information by just being there. And uh, this is the Michelin company. And it's a French tiers company. And, and it's the same Michelin stars, Michelin guide for uh, restaurants. Uh, they had their population with a the problem. They are uh, truck uh, drivers and they go around Europe and they don't know where to eat. So they start collecting data for them because they haven't had an incentive um, analyzing where people eat in different places and give this as a bonus to their truck drivers. So with which data to start and how it will end? Um, there are two parts here. Start with the data that is rooted in the reality. That is something tangible and inherent part of the process that you want. And always take into account the incentives. And make sure you measure something that is aligned with the uh, incentive of the test. Uh, because it makes it more prone to manipulations. Now, the last part, I did all this, I done the process, how, I, how do I know that I did well? Uh, or how do I evaluate what I did? 
So I think here I want to ju give just one example, but example that turned uh, a, a, a fully, uh, a, 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 that completely turned a, a subfield. And the example is Andreas Iniesta. Andreas Iniesta by Wikipedia and by a lot of football fans is often considered one of the best midfielders, mid, midfielders of all time. Um, indeed, amazing midfielder, uh, almost legendary. But when you look at the data that we used to look at the data for generations in football, uh, how many goals he have and how many assists he have. Assists is the pass you give before the goal. Um, his numbers are not crazy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I can do any better. Um, and he is, uh, every goal uh, counts. And he gave also one of the most important goals uh, in the World Cup uh, for Spain for winning uh, the World Cup. But the, we see here that the numbers don't tell the story, right? We have an amazing player that everybody agrees is one of the best, one of the kind, almost a legendary at his uh, own area while he was playing. But the numbers, they don't show it. If you only look at the numbers, it doesn't look that good. I think the, the important lesson to take from here, from this example, is that uh, you always need to have, to do a sanity check. If you come to, to analyze something and your analysis shows a result, but you know that this result is not aligned with the uh, with the reality, you see that something is happening, but you know that another phenomena is happening actually in the real life. Again, going back to the beginning of the webinar, you need to remember that data is just a tool. Maybe somebody wrote the data not in a in a good manner. Maybe you are not asking the right questions. And maybe you have a problem with your query and maybe you want to analyze something else. Uh, we shouldn't go uh, fully blinded uh, after data. We should try to think uh, better. And uh, I think this example of Iniesta uh, incentivized uh, a lot of uh, uh, sports and soccer analysts to find uh, and look for a more uh, sophisticated and uh, more uh, interesting or more deep statistics around football. And a real nice tweet that I saw about it is uh, about a guy which is called uh, Pedri, uh, a young Spanish player uh, who played in the uh, last Euro. Uh, a lot look at him as the predecessor of Andres Iniesta, and he's playing in Barcelona and the uh, Spanish uh, Spanish national team. And the idea here is that the, in the Euro, uh, there was kind of a consensus that he, he had a great Euro, uh, but he had zero goals, zero assists, and zero shots. But now, because of this whole process with addressing yes and understanding that we see great players, but the stats don't show it, so maybe we need to look into new stats, uh, we started measuring a lot of new things. And you can see that he is the top-ranked middle fielder for a lot of other more sophisticated, more in-depth stats, like open play chances that he created, passes in the last third qu quarter of the court, and stuff like that. So to take it, um, how do I know if he did well? Always do sanity check. You've got to do sanity check, make sure that the data um, is aligned with what you know uh, in the reality, right? And to warp it up, to summarize it, um, I think uh, we had uh, going through it as a spine. Uh, you always have to start with a problem. Data is just a tool. You have problems in the real world and data is a good way to analyze them. You need to find data that is rooted in the reality. You can create some uh, sensor data. You can ask for feedbacks, interviews, questionnaires, uh, NPS scores, uh, would you recommend this thing that you actually never recommend to someone else? But try to look for things uh, that are not rating, that are actually part of the process itself that might spare you some manipulations. Um, remember that what you measure is affecting people. If you are uh, having some rating on YouTube, uh, you might have people that are buying uh, those clicks. Um, things that are uh, uh, more interesting is actually people that are engaged with videos. And even in this situation, if someone is buying people that would look at the videos, um, there is enough people that would look at good videos just because it brings them value. So you kind of like uh, balance this away and always do sanity check. Make sure that the data uh, and the, the con new conclusion makes sense to you. Uh, so we went here through all the process, start with the problem before we start with the data part hands-on. Uh, through the data part, Learn about every piece of the process, but please remember there are intersections and think you do, things you do now on your next data analysis might affect you. And uh, always do a sanity check at the end. If you have any more questions, uh, you want to discuss more on data, uh, please uh, stay in touch. 
uh, or get in touch. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Michael Machlevich. You can find me, you can email me, uh, miki.machlevich at uh, gmail.com. Um, Uh, you you will ha- you'll ha- you'll be able to get the slides and I have in the notes links to almost of the all, all of the things that I talked about and uh, thank you very much uh, for being here for listening and uh, for trying to make data proper way data analysis in the proper way thank you